Hi, hi, hi. <laughs> hi, Jens. Jens? Yes, right? I pronounced yeah. it right. Okay. Nice to have you here. Um, tell me something about. Uh, tell me something about love. About love. <laughs> and uh, all at the display, for example. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, a few hearts and a personal touch, and you can make a geek toy into a nice birthday present. Oh, right? and did it work? <laughs> it did work, actually. Okay, so I know what to do next. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you for coming, and let's hear your talk. Thank okay, you. thank you. So, hello, everyone. Um, I will be talking about uh, OPC UA in the context of Industry 4.0 and, and open source. So uh, that talk won't have anything about cloud, anything about testing. Um, it's like a little bit different. Um, so a few words about me. Uh, I work at Red Hat as a senior uh, software engineer in the area of IoT. Uh, and also I'm involved in the Eclipse Foundation. The Eclipse Foundation um, is, is an open source foundation. Uh, they do have an open source um, set of tools uh, also around IoT. Uh, there's an IoT top level project. I'm engaged in that. And I am a committer on, on various um, Eclipse IoT uh, projects. Um, I'm also on Twitter and GitHub and, you know, the default. So a few basics about OPC UA. So one question, who knows about OPC UA? Okay. Who knows about IoT? <laughs> okay. So um, OPC UA in a nutshell. Um, there are different versions or different variants or different aspects of, of IoT. So IoT can be like a, a, small, um, a small device. But also, IoT can be something like the Large Hadron Collider um, at the CERN. So these are like the, the, the different, different angles uh, to, to IoT. So um, everyone wants to, to do IoT now. Uh, but, but some people, some folks have done IoT uh, for, for years already. Uh, that it was called uh, maybe SCADA systems before. That was called PLC. Uh, and now I think it makes sense to, to have the term industrial IoT. That, that pops up every now and then. So um, IoT may be something in the maker area, something in uh, the, the consumer area. Uh, but if you look at, like, for example, power plants, how do you control a power plant? Um, you have IoT technologies there as well. Um, <clears throat> so OPC UA uh, is an IoT, or machine to machine, that was also a term which was coined uh, several years, years back, um, is a protocol for exchanging data there. Um, OPC UA also uh, is an IEC standard. So, um, it's, it's been standardized now, uh, so you can buy the spec and simply implement that, which is an important fact for, for OPC UA. OPC UA um, is built around um, TCP IP. So um, this is also important. Some IoT technologies are, are based, for example, based on Bluetooth. Uh, some of them are based on other wireless protocols or, or serial protocols. Uh, OPC UA is built around uh, TCP IP, uh, and it's point to point. So if you compare this, for example, to, to MQTT, uh, MQTT is like maybe brokered, where you can say, okay, one device sends to many devices. Uh, OPC UA is designed to like connect a client with a server. Uh, that's, that's the basic idea. As I mentioned, um, it's popular in, in industrial automation, industry 4.0. Um, if you have companies like, like Siemens, ABB, for example, uh, they have bigger systems which, which incorporate that. Uh, and they're interested in, in having that uh, as a use case for Industry 4.0. Um, one important difference, for example, if you know MQTT, who knows MQTT? Okay. Um, so MQTT, basically, it doesn't care about the payload. So you have a, a little bit of structure for, for the addresses or for, for the namespace. Um, but it doesn't provide developers when it comes to the actual payload which they're exchanging. Now, Assume you have uh, something like a power plant and you have like, like bigger systems. You want to, to fire up something, shut down something, you have processes, uh, and you have different companies working on that to, to actually build that. You need some kind of, of structure of your data. So just imagine you have a big blob and you can exchange blob between different parties. Uh, so that probably will go wrong at some point. So you need a structure of the data. Um, when it comes to OPC UA, UA means unified architecture. Um, there was OPC DA before that, um, and that was based around uh, the, the idea of, of Microsoft COM. Um, so people used it for quite a while. Um, it's probably still out there, uh, but as Microsoft COM has its issues, um, it was time to create something new. So OPC UA and OPC DA are two completely different things. They have the same like APIs or ideas behind the APIs, 
Um, but technically, it's a completely different thing. And worth mentioning also is OPC UA. When I talk about OPC UA now, I talk about the OPC UA binary protocol. Uh, there are two other variants of that. Um, and the transport layer, you have HTTP with XML, for example. And there's an upcoming uh, PubSub standard, uh, which may want like, like MQTT on a transport level, but having OPC UA in the payload level. So comparing to that. How would you like deploy OPC UA? Um, so as I mentioned before, uh, you have systems like, um, like Siemens, for example, ABB, process control systems, SCADA systems. Uh, that, that would be like the, the automation middleware. Um, you have uh, logic in there, monitoring, uh, trends, whatever functionality you have there. And you want to connect to, to devices. You want to have like a power plant consists of many, many devices. So you want to connect to those. Um, Many of those devices may be PLCs, for example, but also other hardware from other vendors, and you want to integrate that. And OPC UA is like the, the bridge between the devices and, and the different system components. As you see, client server here, uh, so you can layer that in, in, in different variants. And um, what you can do is like you have different building blocks, and um, you can just hook that up now. So you can, whatever you have on the left side, hook that up to the device on the right side. Um, because there is a structure uh, in the data, the device actually can tell you what data it can provide and what the structure of the data is. So the structure. Um, the structure of OPC UA is around namespaces, nodes. Uh, that is a very important concept. So I want to spend a few minutes here. Uh, if you see the, the namespace, um, that is basically some, some, some layer, and there's namespace zero, which is coming from the OPC UA itself, so from, from the infrastructure itself, um, making up um, a set of nodes. Now, what is a node? A node is simply something which can be a folder, a variable, an object, uh, also like a data type, or a whole bunch of other things. And they're all in the namespace. So now you have an ID. This is what you can see up here, NS0I80. So that's, that's one of the, the well-known nodes. Um, so you have an address, which is well-known, and you simply can refer to that. Nodes, they can have references to other nodes. So this is like very, very basic building blocks. But what you can do with that, for example, you can just assume you have a folder node, and the folder node contains variable nodes. So there you have a basic structure where you can, can browse through. You have an API where you can query that. You can, can look into that. And um, we will have a look at this at the demo later, how this looks like. Um, but again, with this basic structure of, of nodes referencing other nodes, you can build quite complex structures. Uh, and the complexity is, is not built in the system, but it's based on that basic principles um, that the data model provides. So with that data model, you can provide all kinds of structures, objects, classes, whatever. Um, and this is all built into the protocol. So if you think about that, that slide before where you have the device, so actually the device can tell its, its clients, look, I have this and that data. So you can ask me for this, and you can ask me for that, and you have an operation here. Um, if you know, for example, uh, Java JMX, it can be a little bit compared to that, um, although it provides like, additional functionality on top of that. So every node, um, every node does have attributes. So an attribute, the, the like, most basic and most important attribute is the value. So if you like, imagine you have um, a variable node, and the variable node does have a value, which could be like a temperature, temperature reading, or something different, pressure, stuff like that. Um, but this is not the only attribute that, that a node has. A node also has like a browse name, a display name, a description. And again, those nodes, um, the, those, those attributes, they also have an ID, and the ID works the same way as you see before. Uh, you have a namespace and um, an identifier. And the identifier, in this case, what I show you here is di equals 80. That's an integer. You can have string identifiers as well. You can have binary identifiers. You can have different uh, identifiers there. Whatever is best for your device. So there's a little bit of complexity in there, but the complexity is simply due to the fact that um, the device may work with registers. So who of you knows Modbus? OK. <laughs> so Modbus is a very simple protocol um, coming from the 80s, I would say, uh, based on a serial, serial transport. 
Um, and one of the core principles of Modbus is you have register numbers. Um, now, if you want to translate that into OPC UA and make an, an easy wrapper for OPC UA to Modbus, um, you can simply use the register number as this identifier, and you don't need any configuration at all. So the whole device that is the whole Modbus device can be supported by OPC UA without any configuration. Now, back to the attribute. So each node has, an, has a set of attributes, um, and every attribute has a value. So you can see here a value, that's a, that's a variant. So um, people who are using COM in the past from, from, from Microsoft, they may reference that, or Visual Basic. Um, there you have the variant. So the variant is a scalar value, but it can have different types. So it can be a Boolean, a string, integer, a float. For OPC UA, it can also be a more complex data structure. So you can put in complete object in there. But when a value gets updated, it always gets updated atomically. So you cannot update part of that, which is not true to completely, but um, for, for easier reference. Yeah. A value also has a quality, and that is important as well. So if you think about um, electrical engineering stuff, you might have wires which actually hook up your, I don't know, uh, temperature transmitter to your devices. And there, um, the connectivity may break. So you don't have a value which you can read, and you can detect actually this, this broken circuit. You can detect that. Uh, now, what, what, what do you do? So you don't read any value. What do you do? Um, some people just say, OK, well, if I don't read any value, I put in minus 1. Well, right, that works. But a temperature of minus 1 is still a valid temperature. So um, what OPC UA provides there, if you read a value, it gives you an indication if this value is good, if it's bad, or if the system just doesn't know if it's good or bad. Um, also, one important thing, together with the value, you have a timestamp. When was this measurement recorded? Um, which is also important because it might be that you have a different layers of, of systems uh, handing the value over to run to each other. Uh, and so it may take a little bit of time. You have a little bit of round trip time between those components. Um, so when was the, the value originally measured? Uh, and that may be important if you have like data analytics based on top of that. The timestamp may be actually pretty important. So that is, in a nutshell, uh, OPC UA. Um, now, again, back, back to that architecture, um, you have the client, you have the server, and you have the device. So what the server basically does is um, it creates this OPC UA API based on the device implementation. Device implementation can be something vendor-specific, um, can be some, some other standard protocol. Um, but the server acts as a translator between the client uh, accessing that uh, and the device. One important interface uh, of OPC UA is getting data out of a device. And for that, you have the, the operations read, which is a synchronous read. So you ask for, OK, give me an update. Um, and you get back a value. You can write to that. Or you can subscribe, which is like, OK, notify me if, if something changes. Uh, and then also one operation which you can make um, is a call. And all of those operations, they are targeted towards a node with this addressing scheme uh, from before. Also, one important thing is like, like if you like compare this to, to for example, MQTT, um, OPC UA provides a whole namespace, which can be hundreds of thousands of, of nodes. But not all nodes are actually active. So whatever the client requires, the server provides, but only that. And it only will talk to the device um, for those subscribed values. So you can reduce the load. Because just imagine you have um, like a system, one million data points. Um, if you have pushed this all into an MQTT broker, like every second you push one million data points, that doesn't scale. That doesn't work. And again, this is not cloud scale. This is like local power plant, which you locally control. Um, so you cannot push everything in the cloud and just scale up some parts. So having a look at open source um, in, in, in this context, as I said before, uh, I'm involved in, in Eclipse IoT. So what is Eclipse IoT? So who knows the Eclipse IDE? Now we want to see a few hands. <laughs> OK. Um, Eclipse IoT is a, is a top-level project, which is a container for other IoT projects at Eclipse. Two important projects there, uh, which we will just see in a, um, in a few minutes, is Eclipse Milo. Milo is an OPC UA stack and SDK written in Java. So what is the difference between stack and SDK? Uh, stack is more the communication part. This is the this is OPC UA binary part. And SDK is more like a set of ready-to-use functions based on top of that. Eclipse 40 is uh, a PLC runtime and IDE. So who knows what a PLC is? 
Okay, a few people. So just think uh, it's a Raspberry Pi, but for productive, uh, productive use. So if you go to a power plant, you don't put a Raspberry Pi for 30 euros. You buy something more expensive, and um, this works a little bit better. Um, but still, um, so Fortiac is a PLC runtime where you like graphically um, wire up your application, and then you download this into the device, and the device will run that for you. Um, but of course, Eclipse IoT has different other projects. Um, maybe Eclipse Pao is some project that you might know if you work with MQTT. Uh, there's Cura and Hono. We had to talk about Hono before. So that is Eclipse IoT. Um, and this is also like, like a map, um, how Eclipse IoT projects integrate with, with each other. So it's not that Eclipse IoT is like a product which you download, like the IDE. Uh, everything's working fine out of the box. No, it's a set of different projects. Some of them are integrated, some of them are less integrated, or not at all. So again, Milo uh, is an implementation of OPC UA in Java. Uh, it is open source, which is important if you want to integrate that into your application, um, build something based on top of that. And it's not based on any OPC, UA, uh, OPC foundation code. So there is an OPC foundation. Uh, it provides the specifications and it provides some, some code. Um, but Eclipse Milo is not based on top of that. Some people, uh, for some people, that's important that it is not. For others, is like the question, why not? Uh, why don't you reuse that? Uh, there are different aspects to that. Fortiac, as I mentioned, uh, is, a, is a PLC runtime. Um, and it's based on, again, another IEC standard. So there are different standards that the IEC provides. Um, this one is about PLCs, because the idea is um, if you program a PLC, you might want to exchange the tools that are working with this PLC and with that model. So if you want to build your own PLC, um, you can build the hardware, you can drop in 40 hack, the runtime, but still you can allow other tools based on the same standards to edit that PLC based on that standard. Again, open source and, and this is the important part here, uh, 40 hack has integration with OPC UA. So uh, what it looks like is that, so just to get, get an idea, and what you see here is um, a blinking LED. So that's how you graphically, in this system, program a blinking LED. Eclipse Fortiac, if you want to try that out, um, if you have Flatpak and, and Fedora or RHEL, it uh, can be pretty simple to, to just install. Um, other ways are, are there for, for other operating systems. That, that works as well. Maybe a little, little bit more complicated, but it works. So open 62451, it's hard to, <laughs> to speak. Um, this is the part which provides, it's again open source, and this is the part which provides an implementation of OPC UA in C and C++. Um, it runs on various uh, operating systems, so there are different, uh, different runtimes uh, where you can, can, can run this on. Um, it's also uh, thought of to, to be run in embedded systems, uh, and the compiled servers, uh, server can be smaller than 100 kilobyte. Um, so that's what I call a microservice, right? It's not two gigabyte of RAM and stuff like that. that that's a microservice. <laughs> we will now have a look at, uh, at a few examples. Uh, and just so you know what, what, what's going on, um, I have a small box here, um, which you most likely cannot see because it's hidden be, be behind that. Um, and this one is, is running the, uh, it's an Intel UpSquare board, uh, which is a nice prototyping kit uh, based on an Intel architecture. Uh, it runs Fedora 28. Um, Fedora 28 has out-of-the-box support for, uh, the Forte, uh, for the Fortiac runtime, the Forte runtime, uh, with compiled support for OPC UA. That's why I just picked that, because you just install a package and, and you're good to go. And in that, we have the blinking LED. And of course, um, every IoT uh, talk should have a blinking LED. So yeah, there it is. Um, but we will see if it actually works. And we have the OPC UA server. And now I will connect with the, with the notebook. Uh, I will connect to that box, and we, we can play around with that based on, on OPC UA. So, and now I really hope that everything works, because this is tricky. So the first thing which I want to show is that is a tool which is not open source. Uh, that's called an OPC Explorer. There are different, um, different types, different vendors providing such a tool. And what you can see, you can just connect uh, to that to that box here, and there you go. You got your um, your object tree, and there you can see. So now the device, which is like like my my small PLC, it provides you with all the information that it can it by itself provide. Now, if you look 
at the, the IDE. So this is now the, the programming IDE, um, which has downloaded the program to this PLC. So you can go here and you can um, have input and output. So maybe some, some of you might know Node-RED. Who knows Node-RED? OK. So Node-RED is, is also like um, you have a graphical programming language, you have nodes, and you have connect, connections between those nodes, and you get a little bit of data here, and you push the data over here. So that is comparable to that. That is based on a standard, which is like um, a very specific execution model. So they are like guarantees, which is important for PLCs. Because if you have, like, uh, I don't know, a gate which opens and closes, but you have some safety mechanisms in there, um, that may be important for you. So what we have on this, on this right side is QX. QX is actually the LED. And uh, now we could check if the LED is actually blinking, because you can see that here. So we can put on a watch. And you see, OK, now that is. It's called out because out meaning out to the LED. But it's false. It's not blinking. So if you could see the LED, it wouldn't be blinking. So now we can like debug into that. So the next component would be here, um, a switch, which like toggles. And then you have uh, the value. And then we, if you go back here, we would see, OK, this is an event. There's no event coming to the switch component. Now we can have a look at the cycle component. And we can watch here, and there we see some events. So this component is, is firing events. Um, but ob obviously, you might see this component in the middle, the permit. The permit is not allowing those events to flow over to the next, to the next component. So this is like this, this flow of events and flow of, of values. Um, and this is, you can kind of see this actually here, because uh, the permit is 0. So it's not allowed to, to push over the events. Now. Um, as you can see, this is wired up to this component, uh, to the subscribe, to the timer state. Um, and that is exported via OPC UA. So that, that is the integration now. You have this internal PLC program. Um, you have the, the value exported uh, over OPC UA. And now we have a dedicated interface to our internal PLC program. But we have an API to that based on OPC UA. And uh, the device told us that. So that is exactly what we have here. We have the permit, and we have this queue over here. And so we can now import that. You can just drag that over here. They can see for a short second it's, it's flashing red, which means I still don't know what the value is. But then it updates, and then you can, can, see, you can see the status code. It's good, so it, it does actually have data. Um, but the data itself, it is false here. And this is nothing which is like, like pre-programmed, so this is the standard Explorer uh, application. So now what we can do is we can manipulate that data. So we just set the permit to true. And then we look over here. And there we got your blinking LED. So now we, we see the output is toggling between true and false. So if you could see the, uh, the LED, it would be blinking now. Just can't see, sorry. <laughs> and the same thing here. Um, as you can see, there's the LED state. So the same value which we send out to the LED is again sent over to OPC UA, so we can, can uh, inspect that. Um, and this is what, what toggles actually here. So here you see the LED toggling over that OPC UA interface. Um, if you look to the right side, you've got this little box of, of attributes, um, which shows you, again, the namespace and a little bit of, of additional information uh, about that, which you can explore so you can introspect into the data model and actually find out. And as I mentioned before, this is now OPC UA with um, basically only two um, components or, or two nodes that are, that are important. But you might have like really millions uh, of those nodes on, on this left side to dig down. So the, the whole communication between uh, this client and server is, is so optimized in a way that um, it can really handle this. So. Let's have a look at source code. So now, if you like, would like to build an application which is compared to that Explorer application which we just saw, you need that toolkit for OPC UA. Um, so the Eclipse Milo project, and this is what, what you can see here. So I try to zoom in a little bit. Hope that works. So. This is a very simple application. And um, well, I say simple, but it looks a little bit more complicated. Um, the thing is, OPC or Eclipse Milo um, makes everything using asynchronous calls on this 
new Java um, completable future pattern. Um, so whatever you do is um, you don't wait for that, but you just like trigger the action uh, on the network socket, and then it waits until the return comes in. And so you have to like chain your your commands using this API, this this Java API. And what we can see here is it simply connects. It, so it triggers the connect, and then uh, it will wait for the the connect to be successful or not successful, and then it will simply disconnect. So this example simply is, is a little bit of code um, which tries to connect, and we'll go and run that. And what we should see is wait for completion. So it's connected and just closes the connection. So this is a very, very, very basic example. Um, if you look a little bit more into that, um, we see the different steps that are happening. So you can see up here, Okay, what, what does it mean to connect with, with OPC UA? You create a client, and then you call connect on that client. That is basically what, what, what that means. How do you create a client? So if you look at the next layer on top of here, so a client is a host, a port, um, and then from that you can get endpoints. So first step is go to your device and ask what endpoints do you support? So again, we look up because we have now endpoints, and then we have to get to, to build a configuration for the client for those endpoints. So how do we do that? So building, building the configuration is simple. Um, you ask the remote site for a list of endpoints, and endpoints can be like different communication parameters, different settings for security, for authentication authorization. Um, and we just enumerate that, get the result, and then we make a selection, so we find the best. So now the problem is with best is what's the best? The best is always different based on your use case. I'm simply taking here the first entry that I find, which is normally the unencrypted, no authentication uh, endpoint. So if you do that, you won't want to do that that way. So best may mean something different for you. So you have to like put in your logic what's what's the best communication endpoint for you. If you don't like that asynchronous pattern. Uh, and I can understand that because it sometimes uh, it makes things more unreadable than, uh, than necessary. You can still fall back to simply calling uh, on, for example, this, this method get endpoints. You can simply call get and wait for the result. So you still fire that using the asynchronous pattern, but then you actively wait for the result to come in. That works as well. So this is connecting. Um, the next thing I want to show you is browse. So again, this is the second operation. We are just querying the remote device for all its information that it can provide. Now again, it's a very simple device. Um, and what you can see here is this is like the tree that we saw before in that graphical representation. This is now a more structured representation, uh, simply iterating uh, over the whole namespace of that device, which we can do because it's only a small one. Um, and there you see like the different nodes that it does provide and, and the the naming of the nodes and the IDs and what node types this is. So you can see some are objects, some are variables. Um, that, that depends here. And you see this, there's more going on. And here what we have is the nodes that we had before. Um, so there they are. Now, the next example. Um, we will go with subscribe. So subscribe. You remember, remember before, we just dragged them from the left side from the tree over to this, to this area for, um, to this tabular area, seeing the results. So this is what subscribe does. Um, we're just firing that up, and there you see, you see the events coming in. That's the blinking LED, basically. Um, again, you see the values, you see the node ID, so what's the source of that? You see the value, you see the state, timestamp, stuff like that. And as I said before, um, there are different attributes for each node, and we are subscribing now to the value attribute, but the same way you can subscribe to the other attributes as well. So whatever this, this data model provides, you can subscribe to all of that. And of course, we can write a value. So I'm going ahead and I can pre-configure that so I can write false. So I'm now sending out the, the command, can close that. So I send out the command to reset that permit to false, which means that the LED stops blinking now. So we can have a look at this uh, at, the, at the PLC debugging that. So again, you can see now it stopped with true, uh, but it's no longer blinking. 
and you see that uh, the events are not permitted to go beyond that component. If you have a look now at this, um, where do we have this? This subscribe application. So subscribing can be a little bit complicated, as you can see. So this is the whole example of how do I subscribe to a value. Um, but there's a reason for that. So if you look up here, this is the main method. And there, again, you have connect. So it's reusing that. Uh, it's connecting to the device. And when a connection is established, it starts to create these subscriptions. And with the subscriptions, you have like a multitude of options which you can put in, like how frequently do I want to get notified? So the client can actually specify, OK, I want to get notified every second or maybe every minute. And the server can take that to the device again and can say, OK, I only have a client which is interested in a value update every minute. So I don't need to pull the device every second. Um, so I can like schedule updates with the device as well. So you see this is how like all putting end to end, um, trying to, to, to bridge that as good as possible, making it as efficient as, as possible. Um, if you look here, simply setting up a single subscription can be a bit tricky. Um, so it is, it is complex, but it gives you all the options. Now, the question is, sometimes it's only interesting to have a value, get an update, and that's it. So how do we like, like simplify that? Of course, you can write your own um, library for, for simplifying that. There are uh, also like several tutorials where it can, um, which you can reuse, of course. And you will have the source code of this repository as well, where there are the, the other examples. Um, but one thing which you can do is you could use Apache Camel, for example. So um, now comes Spring Boot. <laughs> we have a Spring Boot example, um, which basically fires up an Apache Camel context. So who knows Apache Camel? You know everything, right? <laughs> um, that's good. So Apache Camel is um, a, a Java set of tools uh, where you have endpoints, uh, and you can connect them in, in different patterns. Um, for example, you can connect some MQTT to Apache Kafka. So pushing data left to right. In the middle, you can add like components that, that transform the data, um, that manipulate that, that aggregate and, or enrich or filter out, um, filter out that. And what we can do here, this is like a route definition. Um, this is a simple route which subscribes from um, the Milo client, Milo being OPC UA, uh, it subscribes to that value, which is the blinking LED. And first of all, it writes that to, to the output, standard output, so you can see it on the console. And then we transform that. So we transform that in a way that um, we put in a string, we concatenate that, uh, extract the value here, and then again, we put it uh, on the output. So what we should see is now updates, if I start that, uh, we have a chem example here. So you see, Java 11 still gives a few warnings. Um, and now we get one update. Um, why don't we get more? Because we stopped the LED before. So um, still when we connect, we get the last update of the value. Um, so when we connect, we don't need to, to like wait for the first update, but we get an initial update. Um, and there, the, the source timestamp is important. Because now we don't know when this update was. Was it now or was it like a minute ago? Um, but with the timestamp, we can, we can tell that. And then we go ahead here, simply enabling that again. And there it runs. So, and this is this simple line of, of XML basically did the same thing as we had before with this rather complex setup uh, of Java code extracting, subscribing, uh, and, and giving that to the standard out. Um, it doesn't provide the full capability, though, of, of OPC UA. But for some use cases, this may be good enough. So you don't need to like program a lot of code for, for OPC UA. Um, a little bit of XML might, may be enough for your use case. Uh, the same way, you can have a server. So right now, Milo, we only saw the server. The PLC, uh, Milo, Milo was only the client. Um, the PLC was the server. Um, but we, what we can see here is um, a little bit of XML um, providing a server. So if you want to write your own server, someone wants to consume OPC UA um, from you, um, we add a new connection. Let me 
check which one this was. Not this one. Not this one, but this one. There we go. So here you see, this is what I just did. I enumerated those endpoints, and I can choose now. Now, I manually choose, and I just go for the unsecure one. That's fine for me. Connect. And there I see the camel item. Now I just pick that. <coughs> there you see, get the value update. Uh, so that is provided by this XML snippet. And what it does is, if you saw this before, it's polling the file system, extracting the value, converting this into a double. And this is exactly the, the temperature of the CPU upstairs. So finishing that up, that was the demo. Um, there is more. So this is two projects which we saw now for OPC UA. There's a list of projects um, for different programming languages. So if you want to have Node.js, um, you can do that. I can encourage you, try this at home. The slides will be, will be available. Um, the GitHub repositories as well. Um, there's the upstream project, Eclipse Milo. Uh, there is Fordiac. There's a community around that which can help to, to get you started. Um, any questions, please ask them later uh, at the HeapCon booth. And thank you, and thanks to those people for the background images. Mm-hmm. <laughs>